Well, by now, Tent City had become a great seaside resort, attracting all levels of society. Even if you already had a home in San Diego or Coronado, it was common to arrange for a summer tent, if available, and usually the same one each year so that gradually people knew exactly where to find you without having to check the registry. By now, too, there were some hard and fast rules at Tent City. No immoral or objectionable conduct will be tolerated. Decency requires that ladies' bathing garb cover everything but the arms. Long-distance telephone and telegraph service was available. There was twice-daily mail delivery, a ladies' hairdressing parlor and a gentleman's barber shop, and daily trips to the Coronado Islands, located 14 miles offshore, were provided, where a glass-bottom boat awaited eager tourists. There were reading and writing rooms, magicians, and barbershop quartets. On occasion, such grand dignitaries as American composer John Philip Sousa would stop by to entertain. Sousa, of course, wrote Stars and Stripes Forever. By 1906, there were, in addition to the red and white striped tents, palm cottages set on wooden frames with thatched roofs. They rented for about $12 per week based on their location and housed two to six people in their one room. Some of them had indoor running water, but the cottages still tended to have leaky roofs during Coronado's infrequent rainstorms. Tent City liked to advertise that, owing to the entire absence of rowdyism, mothers can leave their children here to romp at will. Coronado was indeed a paradise for young children. Daily adventures included children's bullfights, Shetland pony and mule rides, and trained seal and monkey acts. There seemed to be no end to the wonderful and unique summer mischief, such as setting snapper firecrackers or coins on the trolley tracks, and always for the very young, the chance to be starched, ruffled, and set up for judging in the beautiful baby contest. In 1910, a new dance pavilion was built to replace the Silvergate Casino, costing $30,000. It shut down by 11 p.m. so that the San Diego crowd could catch the last ferry boat back to San Diego at 11.35 p.m. Now that year, they were able to advertise that the chef at the Tent City Cafe was none other than the White House chef during the Cleveland administration. Tent City had become the resort to summer in, and reservations were required far in advance. In fact, a savvy visitor would usually make his arrangements for the next summer before he departed in the fall. Trees and greenery had begun to grow now, and even the tents began to take on a permanency. Many began to reflect the personality of their inhabitants. Flags and various signs often adorned the exterior, and tent dwellers frequently had amusing names painted on the sides of their abodes, such as the Who's In, the Where In, Nobody's In, Never In, and of course the inevitable Do Drop In and Wobble Out. They came from all across the country, and their comings and goings and social doings were recorded in the daily program, later to become the Tent City News. The daily program included weather and tide reports, local gossip, names of visitors with their tent numbers, upcoming events such as the baby Alfreda Smith's exhibition of her incomparable dancing skills, and of course timetables for the trolley connections with the ferry. For many years, the daily program was Coronado's only newspaper. One of its most popular editors was a fellow named R. Beers Luz. He was the father of future author Anita Luz, who penned Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. For food, a vegetable wagon would come to the door of your tent, or if you preferred to dine out, various restaurants were at your disposal. There was a pool hall where you could also buy your favorite cigar, and you and your buddies could gather around and play billiards all day. Tent City was enjoying one of its biggest summers ever, when the guns of August 1914 were heard around the world. For the next few years, soldiers could be seen mixing with the sun worshippers, and many of the regular Tent City events took on a patriotic flavor. There were military balls to benefit the war effort, and rousing marches were a regular part of the band program. As a guest of Mr. and Mrs. Spreckles, Madam Schumann Hank, the great opera singer, gave a concert for 16,000 people at the band pavilion. All the proceeds from this event went to the Allied war effort, although tragically and somewhat ironically, the great Contralto had one son fighting on the German side and one on the Allied side. Now, even though one of the favorite tent city games of the time was something called Knock the Head Off the Kaiser, 
Europe still seemed very far away, and there were so many marvelous things to do right here in Coronado. One popular pastime was canoeing. There was a float in the bay with a capacity for 400 bathers, and there was a bayside grandstand for viewing the various swimming and diving events. There was a high dive tower, there was surfboard riding, water skiing, and daring aviation exhibitions. In fact, it was not unusual for planes to land right on Coronado Beach, either intentionally or by accident. Bathing beauty contests were held, and there were shops where you could buy cupie dolls and pillow tops. There was even a French Indian mentalist skilled at giving mind-reading demonstrations and reading tarot cards. People continued to throng to Tent City, and one of the most popular places was the new and enlarged bathhouse. It was now located on the bayfront and did a brisk business. In July of 1918, 25,000 patrons were accommodated. It had 237 changing rooms, with state-of-the-art laundry machines and $1,500 worth of new bathing suits for rent. On July 4, 1919, the crowds at Tent City gathered beneath the loudspeakers to hear the heavyweight championship broadcast of the Jess Willard-Jack Dempsey fight all the way from Toledo, Ohio. Jack Dempsey took the title from Willard in a third round TKO. The country was electrified. You see, in 1919, people still had time to enjoy all that was offered in this tiny seaside magic land. There was time to listen to the Hawaiian singers, time to watch the fire jumpers, to taste the delights at a chop suey parlor or a Parisian waffle shop. And always, always, there was time for that most wonderful of experiences, the summer romance. But life moves on, and somehow, slowly, changes began to take place even at Tent City. They were, as far as we can tell, changing so very slowly that no one really seemed to notice. By 1925, there were free nightly movies instead of the band concert, parking facilities for cars had been installed, and of course the crowds began to thin. What Prohibition failed to do, the Depression succeeded at. Still, the good times were there. We see that a children's train was added in the late 20s. But things were definitely declining at Tent City. In 1926, Spreckles died, and with that passing, an era unperceived slipped very quietly away. Complaints were heard from the Tent City patrons. There were sand fleas and roaches, too much noise, not enough comfort. And then came the 30s. Permanent wooden cottages were built to encourage Tent City use year-round, but even they couldn't hold back the sounds of the death knell for a way of life that had literally outlived itself. The call was now for the open road. The family automobile could take you further than any trolley or any streetcar ever could, and further is exactly where people wanted to go. And so nobody cared when Tent City announced it would not open its doors for the 1939 season. Only a few even came to watch as the permanent buildings one after another were knocked down and their boards pried off with a squeal of rusted nails renting the air. The old arcade was demolished, the great dance pavilion which had already become a roller rink was torn apart, and the roof trusses had been hauled to North Island to be used in the building of a new theater going up there. The palm-thatched cottages and wooden cabins were sold off for next to nothing and hauled to places like Imperial Beach, Chula Vista, National City, and even Julian for use as summer homes, or even kept in Coronado for light construction on homes here on the island. The streetcar tracks were ripped up. The old streetcars were towed away and burned as scrap. Concrete from the demolished buildings would be used to form part of the bulkhead on Glorieta Bay. In 1941, the State Highway Department filled and widened the road down the Silver Strand, and we took that highway on to other amusements and other adventures. In their haste to explore the future, very few took the time to look back, yet in doing so, there is always that feeling that we will never be quite as young or quite as innocent ever again. Perhaps the most appropriate epilogue to our story can be found in the prose of A.W. Ball when he wrote, Backwards, turn backwards, O oh, time and your flight, make me a child again, just for tonight. Thank you for sharing this special look into our past, and thank you to Jerry McCarty and Nancy Cobb for their thoughtful prose, which served as inspiration for today's presentation. <laughs>